Hi everybody, welcome to our online version of the message. If you'd like to join us in person, you can always do that on the second and fourth Saturdays of the month at Hill City. We are continuing our series called Intertwined, which has been all about relationships. And so as we conclude this series, I was reflecting back on some relationships in my own life. About five years ago, I talked with a woman who invited me over to her home because she was interesting, interested in learning more about the Bible and discipleship. We had a good time, uh, we talked a lot, and we actually found out we had gone to the same church as teenagers. A few months before that, I had rushed into a Starbucks and sat down with two men for an interview. I was late and I was trying to gather my thoughts. And one of the men who asked me m most of the questions was very personable, but the other sat silently for most of the conversation and was occasionally scribbling notes. I wasn't sure what he was thinking. About 20 years ago, I walked into a history classroom and saw another girl across the way and she was smiling and chatting and just seemed like a really friendly person. I had no idea that she was feeling as out of place as I was. About 33 years ago, I had a very serious conversation with a neighbor about trying to, tell, uh, trying to sell my new baby sister from our family. She had asked if she could have her for $5 and I said yes. These seemingly unrelated stories over uh, the span of my lifetime have one theme in common, the theme of today's sermon, which is friendship. I didn't know when I met with Monica in her home to talk about discipleship that that would turn into doing ministry together over the years or that we would become friends. But a month or so ago, uh, as I was sobbing uncontrollably in the car with no ability to process my spiraling thoughts, I had the sudden urge to call her and she immediately uh, parked the car, kicked her kids out and did that. She prayed over me. And I didn't know when I interviewed with Paul and John for the internship at Hill City that the mostly silent pastor was anything but, or that over the course of our time working together, he would example a level of humility and care that would help heal some very deep wounds related to church experiences. And I didn't know that John or anyone else at a church could actually become such a dear friend, not to mention Candace and Jen and the rest of the team. I didn't know my freshman year of high school that Emily wasn't actually as happy as she looked and that she and I would bond over musicals and volleyball and a whole lot of other more important things too. And actually that we would celebrate two decades of friendship together uh, on a trip to Portland. And I didn't know at all when my sister Abby was born and she just seemed like an annoying uh, new addition that was stealing all the attention from me that God was actually giving me a best friend for life, someone who would help me to stop carrying everything, who would let me vent about things, make me hot chocolate on difficult days, and encourage me to rest. And saying all this is actually really strange as I reflected back on these friendships, because these are just a few of the examples I could give, and yet, I often find myself in conversation saying these words. Making friends as an adult is just so hard. Have you heard that? Have you said that before? I feel like it might be a millennial refrain. I've heard it so often from people. Maybe it's not just unique to my generation, but I hear that a lot. Making friends as an adult is just so hard. But I think what we really might mean by that, or what I thought as I reflected back, is that the process of making friends takes a long time and can be very difficult. That there are years and years of texts and phone calls and layers of conversation and conflict and moments of crisis, shared dreams, shared hope, shared fears. And all of those take a long time to build into a friendship. I'd like to jump right into our scripture for today, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. 
It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Chances are you have likely heard this passage read at a wedding or referenced in terms of romantic relationships, which is all well and good, but there's a much broader scope of application for this passage. In the context of this letter, it's not actually directed at married couples. It's written by Paul, who was a celibate single man, lest we forget, serving a single Lord. And Paul is encouraging a church community in upheaval that has been torn apart by conflict. And he had been sharing previously with them in this letter how the spiritual gifts of individuals in a church community are to be used for building one another up not for invoking status or proving your worth above another's. Then he launches into these verses, sharing that more than anything, even the necessary outworking of important spiritual gifts, it is self-sacrificial love that should mark the Christian community, which might be an idea you've heard so often, it becomes a bit like white noise. Yeah, we get it, love is important. But let's read these verses again. They may be all too familiar to us, but let's read them again in the message paraphrase. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. I don't know about you, but imagining the type of community, the types of friendships where these things take place, where this type of love is shown, is inspiring and actually revolutionary. Imagine it, a friend who always comes after you, a friend who always speaks well of you, a friend who challenges you and forgives you, a friend who wants to speak truthfully, a friend who encourages you to trust God with all the complexities of life. If you haven't experienced this in community or with an individual friendship, it's pretty clear who Paul is pointing to as the example of all these things. He's pointing to Jesus who is our ultimate example of friendship, our ultimate friend as believers. And if you don't believe me, you don't have to look any farther than the Gospel of John, where this image of Jesus as a friend is all over the place. And it's all over the place in the epistles of John as well. Uh, consider 3 John, where the address dear friends is used over and over. But let's look at John 15, 13 through 15. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Revolutionary. That the gospel the gospel message itself is all about friendship. Jesus, the ultimate friend who gave up status to make us his friends so that we could in turn call others friend. Let's back up the train a little bit. Maybe you don't know or aren't convinced yet why this would be revolutionary. Of course, you might say it's normal to think of friendship this way. That's what friends do. They love each other. But in the day this letter was written, 1 Corinthians was written, and also today, I would argue, that's not actually the case. It isn't as normal as you think. Plato, who predated Paul, the Greek philosopher, wrote about the concept of friendship and essentially concluded that true friendship can only exist between people in the middle class. Two people in the middle class. This way, there would be no superior or inferior, and they'd be more likely not to try to earn something from another person, like money or status. 
And we might say, oh, that's not really true today, but like Plato, we can see examples all around us of people who only hang out with those who make them look good. Those who have similar views or political perspectives, economic status, relationship status, and the list goes on and on. We want to be with those who are most similar to us. Aristotle similarly wrote of friendship as always having utility or usefulness. Essentially, there has to be something in it for people, even if it's simply the ability to have an equally intellectual conversation about something. But he also talks about practical reasons like gaining status or wealth. We can also see examples of this all around us. We don't want to be friends with people who have nothing to offer us, right? We gravitate towards those, even some sub uh, subconsciously, who are able to help us in some way, who reflect a certain image that we want. In other words, are they cool or not? So this idea of love, of self-sacrifice, and of lowering oneself to become friends with another, to give our status away, was not common then, and it's not common today. Christians should think differently about friendship, writes Paul Waddell, because their understanding of friendship is rooted not in rosy accounts of human perfectibility, but in a God who remains ever faithful to us and who never, no matter how egregious our failings, writes us out of the story of divine love. We love because he first loved us. We serve because he first served us. We offer care and compassion and grace because as believers, those things are ours through Christ. Now, the unspoken question at this point might be, sure, uh, that is great, but doesn't that all sound exhausting? If all of that's only on me and I don't get anything out of it, and I don't think that's a bad question. After all, the best friendships in your life are not one-sided affairs where you give everything and they give nothing. That's not really friendship. The base understanding of what kind of love Jesus calls us to is incredibly important. But the best friendships in life happen not just with individual conviction of that sort of love, but when two people both live out, however uh, imperfectly, that same truth. Love exists in community. So we see love is patient most clearly when two people are disappointed at different times with each other and still choose to endure, to wait it out, to forgive one another. We see love isn't proud when Two people or more, a whole community, maybe a whole house church, take it upon themselves to quickly serve one another, to create a culture of offering help, to have good humor even when somebody says something that could be taken the wrong way. When two people brag about each other, when they speak well of each other, when they make room for others to speak. We see love is forgiving, not just when one person unceasingly plays the martyr and gives up their sense of self to say, oh, it's okay every time they're hurt, but when two or more people are committed to assume the best and work things out, to apologize quickly, to honestly express hurt, and then when something is resolved, not to use those past things as weapons against each other. Love shows up not only be between Christians, we know the image of God is in everyone, but it should show up most clearly among Christians. How sad that that isn't always the case, that we'd rather adopt the standards for love and friendship from the shallow end of the pool. Who do I agree with the most? Who has the same lifestyle as me? Who can teach me how to dress better? Who has something to give me? Who looks like me? Monica doesn't like fantasy movies. It's really strange. <laughs> Gio and I don't agree on everything. Candace's work life looks extremely different from mine. Paul and I do not have the same workout routine. Jen has kids and I don't. Completely different life stages. The list could go on and on and yet, each of those people and so many more are friends in my life because there is a mutual conviction 
that to be a friend is to look like Jesus in someone else's life. To be a friend is to look like Jesus in someone else's life. Are we actually doing that? It's not that mutual interests are bad. That's a great thing to connect on. And it doesn't negate the fact that certain personalities just don't click. But I do wonder if those things can be true and it can also be true that given humility and grace and sacrifice, friendship can show up in very unexpected places. What did Jesus have in common with his disciples or with us for that matter? But he came to make us his friends. Could it be uh, that we aren't actually trying out this mode of friendship? There's a rise in advice around the internet to cut toxic people from your life. You've probably heard this. And I am not saying there's not merit to that because there is a certain point at which you may not be able to have a relationship with someone. But I do wonder if what we label as toxic might just as easily be a situation where we are unwilling to be humble or to have conflict, where we are not expressing vulnerability or not showing compassion. Could it be that you are just one conflict conversation away from deeper friendship? One act of forgiveness, one moment of emotional honesty apart from finding the deep relationships that you are longing for. It isn't easy to make friends. I think we can all agree on that. But maybe that has more to do with the skin we're willing to put into the game than a lot of other factors. We're gonna be um, closing with discussion in our normal service, and I have a list of some homework I would like people to try. So I wanna leave these with you as well in the online version. And I want you to consider which of these things might be something God is asking you to do this week. So number one is reconnect with an old friend. Maybe for you, somebody has been on your mind for a while that you haven't spoken to. It could be years, could be months, but they once had a relationship with you and don't anymore. I want you to reach out to them this week. Maybe it is that you could connect with a could-be friend. Maybe there's somebody in your life you've been interested in knowing better, but just haven't been able to make the time to get coffee or touch base. Maybe that is your assignment for this week. Maybe it's to have a conflict conversation with a friend. There's been something you've been holding on to, and you just don't know if it's worth it to talk to them about it. I'm challenging you have that conversation with your friend. Another option would be to tell a friend something you deeply appreciate about them. Find somebody to encourage this week, somebody who's been in your life as a friend. And then finally, ask a friend what's going on in their lives and listen to them deeply. We talked about incarnational listening in our conversation last week, so you could check that out. But Ask a friend what's going on in their lives and actually really lean in and listen. Let's close with 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 again. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time uh, discovering what you have to say about your friendship towards us and how we can act out that same type of friendship towards others. We ask as your disciples, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us the ability to be Jesus in the lives of other people around us, that you would cultivate deep mutual friendships in your church and that Hill City would be known as a community of friendship. Pray, Lord, that we would seek out intentionally those people who may be the most different from us, 
to grow in Christ likeness and to discover your love more deeply through friendship with people that we wouldn't have considered friends before. And we just ask, Lord, that you would guide us in, in this week to take practical steps to deepen the friendships we have and maybe to start new friendships too. In Jesus' name.